So here we are once again, getting ready for another project. Been a while actually. But we're gonna make a carbon fiber plate. That carbon fiber plate will um, have a name engraved in it and then the engraving part or portion will be highlighted by gilding paste in gold color. So kind of neat here. So this is the early preparation. It is cold out in the garage here. I am gonna say it's about 45 and here we are getting ready for the station we have five layers of two by two 5.7 ounce twill 6k cut up in sheets here we got the carbon excuse me a metal plate that's been sanded with the light sandpaper and uh, we are ready to go with that heater is on and the next thing we're going to do is we're going to prep it with release agent so that is step number one So step number one, we're going to treat this plate with a release agent. We're going to treat the whole plate with it, even though we're not going to use the entire plate. We brush it on, make sure everything gets covered. If you have any holes in it, the epoxy will obviously stick onto it and uh, you're not going to be happy with the outcome here. There are many different release agents on the market and <clears throat> it really depends on what you have available to you and dare I say what you can afford because some of these things are, well, rather pricey. So there it is. All done. So today is the big day. We have everything set up. The plate's been um, treated with release agent and we have about as smooth of a surface as we can. Heater has been going for about an hour. Um, it is, uh, well, currently 16 degrees outside. <laughs> so this is important. Plate's about 90 degrees. That's about where you want it to be. You can use all kinds of uh, resin, whatever you want. I prefer, this has been my choice Oh man, since the last, what, 18 years since I switched from polymers, excuse me, uh, polyesters to polymers. Uh, Max 1618 out of polymer composites in uh, Ontario, California. They do really, really good stuff. So anyway, now it's time to mix some resin. Normally I got two gloved hands, but uh, today I need to operate a camera. So uh, that can present a little bit of an issue. One to two ratio on this particular polymers here. So whatever you put in, uh, I'll put twice as much as this as I put the other in. And I use weight method as well. is um, well, been on the shelf for about a year so I need to uh, to get rid of this I shouldn't say get rid of it but um, need to be used so I'm going to mix a bit more than I have here's 300 grams of this I always enjoy to clean the uh, the buckets if you wish so when you put the lid back on it is nice and clean then don't use this for the next one but in fact on the next one fresh sheet and then it's time for the curing agent so 
So about 150 of that. There you have it. So now we have a perfect one to two ratio between the uh, resin and the curing agent. You can now set that away. Now the next step, well, you gotta mix it first, obviously. Um, I mix it a whole lot faster than I normally would. <clears throat> normally you would wanna go nice and easy, try to avoid stirring any um, air bubbles in there. But um, we're gonna heat the resin a little bit more. It's been inside at 75 degrees, and we're gonna elevate it to 90 degrees. And then we're gonna put it in the, uh, I call it my little decompression chamber. But we can uh, use vacuum to extract all the air bubbles that might have gotten in here by me stirring it, or it's just a fact, I'm not sure you can see it, but there's always gonna be a little bit of a air that you stir into it. So again, you don't want to stir it this fast unless you have a, uh, a vacuum chamber where you can in fact, um, well, recover the uh, the air back out of the resin. So you stir here for about a minute. And again, it depends on what kind of resin you have. There are so many different great resins out there. Mine is not necessarily better than anybody else's. But that's what I use and they have treated me well with customer support and they have a, a variety of uh, different products that I have used over the years for so many different projects. Uh, whatever floats your boat, so to speak. So here is a mi minute. Nice thin viscosity. I enjoy that. We'll wipe the stir stick because you never know what you need to fix with that later. Don't have to. Some people just toss it, which is fine too. That is then down here, waiting for something else. On to the chamber. Vacuum chamber. Consists of two things. It has a vacuum pump and then a chamber. Now you can buy these pre-mades if that's uh, what you would like, or in, in my case, I made my own. So the whole idea is that, uh, well, you want to um, suck the air out of the resin, so to speak. I'm not sure if you can see it, hopefully you can, but we're gonna start the machine. And we'll slowly close, <clears throat> and you'll see the resin will almost, almost begin to boil. Not sure if you can see it, but we are at um, 25 inches of mercury or water, and you can see that it is in fact starting to uh, well boil. Now it'll boil up, so it's important that you catch that, otherwise you have a mess on your hands. <clears throat> and then when that happens, all you do is just open the relief valve a little bit, and. Um, That'll let go of some of it. That keeps floating the bubbles to the surface. And um, if it's really tough resin, this particular resin, I love the viscosity. It works so beautiful. But it is, uh, it has a lot of surface tension to it which uh, what I do is I go halfway through here and then I just spray just a small amount of acetone on the bottom and that, um, well, takes care of it. Anyway, 
See you later. So you can see it's quite going in there. I uh, lifted the lid and I just used the heat gun to uh, just heat the surface up a little bit above 100 degrees is where all the magic happens. So you can see now that it's a little bit different that it is popping like, uh, well, boiling water really like it should be. So either spray a little bit of acetone on it. If you don't chemically have to treat it, I prefer to just use a heat gun and treat that. But you can definitely see that it's popping here. So uh, once that cone has risen back down, then it is time to, um, uh, well, start the layout. And as far as the heat gun, whatever that you got, I have one of these on low for about, I'd, like I said, I just elevated the surface to about 100 degrees and then uh, that takes care of, breaks the surface tension on this particular resin. Other resins uh, might not have that uh, particular trait, but that's what this one does. It is then time for the layup. Resin is nicely recovered, not a bubble in there. So one of the most important things to remember when you do uh, carbon fiber or composite layups is you always need to um, put resin on first. You put the resin on the bottom and then you squeeze it through the fibers. That way you don't have to massage it through from the well the side that you want to make pretty should I say. I'm just going to go inside the, the perimeters of this by I'm going to say about an inch or so, that'll match what I have. So you can see starting to take shape. Careful of watching for brush hairs. I use cheap brussels or brushes. And oh, there's one. Keep a toothpick around me for just that occasion. There it is, one hair off. And I believe that's the only one that was there. So what you can do, if you don't like all of these uh, bubbles that are in there, just go over it really quick with a heat gun, because inevitably you will stir bubbles in there. This is the surface that's gonna be pretty or the surface that people is going to look at. So if you just uh, use a heat gun, what you do is you heat the resin up, the bubbles will migrate to the surface, they'll pop because you're breaking the surface tension with this. Really, really simple way to, well, use tools that are not necessarily very intrusive to the chemistry of the polymers that you're using. What you do need to be aware of is anytime you heat the resin up, you are essentially um, shortening the curing time so be aware of that and also obviously thermal runaway if you heat it up too high um, then you might have an issue with almost uh, uh, it could thermally run away so things to be aware of not a big deal all you want to do is just kind of pop the bubble so to speak Then the first layer goes down. Now there are, or has to be, a thousand different ways how you want to do that, how you want to saturate this. I prefer a squeegee gently massaging the fibers down very careful with emphasis on gently what you want to do is force all the air that is now trapped underneath the um, the fibers so you're using the squeegee as a kind of a wet out tool and you can see when you're starting to push resin up through the squeegee then you have achieved 
what you need to do. But obviously you want to be careful that you're not disturbing the fibers to the point that uh, it now became a, a messy layout. So be mindful of that. You can also use a brush. It really is whatever you like and that you feel more comfortable with. The idea here <clears throat> is that you get rid of all of the air that is trapped between the resin, excuse me, the plate and your fibers. So again, how you do this is really, really up to you. Go easy. Once you feel you have, <coughs> you have a good then you repeat as necessary one more layer of resin. And I think we're there. This is a non-structural part. This is, see how the fiber is uh, torquing when you do this? So very, very careful. Um, this is a plaque, so to speak, with a name. So there is um, no structural properties needed for that plaque. It'll be in a frame. So I'm not paying as much attention to thickness, resin to fiber ratio, um, which is also why I don't have a, a chemical, not chemical, mechanical rather, constraint of this. Layer number two. Gently put it in place without disturbing your matrix to the best of your ability. And then again, gently, squeegee the resin through. What you want to avoid is a lot of pressure per square inch say if you starting to use your fingers you can't do that but you again have to be very careful because the pressure per square inch is substantially higher with your fingers so the probability of you creating voids on even layup is by far bigger once the resin grabs the fibers, you can see that it's no longer moving as much. Now the next layer, again, I'm just trying to get rid of, I shouldn't say get rid, that's a terrible word, but I have a lot of uh, leftover fibers that I've cut from different projects and as this is a non-structural member, again, just a, uh, a piece to look at, I'm gonna utilize a couple of cutlings of fabrics that I've used in the past. And I uh, am not a fan of throwing things out, really. So I'm going to use those. Now you see I plaster quite a bit of resin on here. Normally you would need to pay more attention. So this piece here is overlapping. Or will need to be overlapped. 
you can see that it's not covering all the way but it's a piece that I had left over so I'm going to utilize a couple other pieces here would you normally do that? Nah, not really I mean if you're going to build something and go through the trouble and build something you may as well do it right but again this is still carbon fiber and it means absolutely nothing if you have that in a layup in the middle. So here we go. One here. And one there with maybe a half a millimeter of a overlap. I hate to waste uh, carbon, not because of the cost necessarily, but I just don't enjoy wasting stuff. So we're going to omit the squeegee part here and go straight to the next one because this is a sort of partial piece and if I start torquing on this it'll really move in relation to the smaller pieces that are on there as well. All right, on to layer number four. carefully move the fabrics if you pull in one direction carefully go well in the other direction and as much pressure as you feel you mechanically can add without it contorting is a good thing again this is going to be the back side of the plaque so nobody's going to look at this so it really won't matter. And then we got the last layer for a total of five. This is again uh, 5.7 ounce 2x2 two 12 two 6k 6k means that there's 6,000 strands in each toe and the 5.7 ounce is uh, one yard of the square yard weighs that much so here you have it last layer don't mind the instant water heater kicking in <clears throat> and looks like here is our last layer of resin. Top piece of carbon fiber on the plate.
just continue the squeegee if you're starting to push a little bit of a wave of fiber excuse me resin in the front of you uh, that means you just got too much pressure so just back it off a little bit and you'll be fine As you are pressing the fiber down, it will conform better and not be as easy to move. Just about done. You can see that it's a <clears throat> it simply moves less. Oops, no particularly done it. It moves less towards the end here. Of course, this is again a plaque that'll be engraved. So thickness, strength, resin to f uh, fiber ratio is not important. What I wanted to illustrate is how easy it is to make a carbon plate. Now you can buy it and go that route too. And maybe that's what you want to do. They're expensive. And you can obviously make this for under $30. Well, providing that you have the materials. But for sure, carbon fiber is cheaper to make than if you buy it pre-made, no doubt. And there you have it. One layout that is now done. Now we will let it cure. It's going to reach a temperature of about 95 degrees with a heater on here. And uh, we'll come back when it's finished. Arrivederci. So here we are. It's the next day. <clears throat> this plate has been um, heated till about 9 p.m. last night at about 100 degrees. And uh, just to ensure good cure since I have uneven heat here in the garage. Due to the cold temperatures, it is currently uh, 16 degrees outside. So one of the benefits when you have a piece like this, um, aluminum is the best. This uh, metal piece is second best, I would say. Um, I stuck it outside in a 16 degrees and what happens then all the metal contracts and the coefficient of thermal uh, expansion is different than the carbon that's on the top of it. So the metal will contract more than this one will. Carbon is more neutral. So what that happens is, uh, especially with aluminum, <clears throat> you really can uh, ensure a, a good release. And, and it'll always come off. It's not a matter of that. It's just a matter of I'm trying to create something aesthetically pleasing on the other side of this carbon. And uh, because it'll be engraved and whatnot. And obviously if there's flaws and imperfections, well, that's not going to be as aesthetically pleasing. So the, the more easy release you can get, the better off will you be. So just make sure that we are actually uh, receiving everything. So what you try to do here is you, you can very carefully try to lift. Yeah, looks like it's fine. So I lift it with something very sharp. Then I have a, uh, well, oak chisel, if you wish. Um, that I tend to use 
And, and that's why you have an overlap in this case of about an inch. So you facilitate that to get the oak in. And there you hear it popping. Oops. And that hopefully is a good release. And there you have it. That looks beautiful. There's a couple of small places where you can see there's just a tiny void here as well. But overall, I'd say this is a pretty nice carbon plate. Satin finish. <clears throat> of course, this will have a lacquer to it. I have done this in the past. Uh, only to my horror to find out that when I lifted it, there was a strand of carbon fiber that just kind of laid down in the middle of it. Uh, so yeah, that's a that's a no bueno one. Static electricity. So next, what we're gonna do is uh, we're gonna we're gonna trim um, the piece off to what is needed. But I'd say. Very, very nice. Very light too, obviously, but that's again, not an issue. But um, if you were to buy a carbon plate that's roughly two feet by 10 inches, you'd be shelling out a pretty penny. And uh, yeah, that's just what I needed. A little bit of a torque on the fabric. I'm not sure if you can see it here. Let me see if I can get a little closer. Just ever so slight. Right there, torque of the fabric. But um, other than that, result is great. Plate is ready for another one. Until next time. Then it is time to mark and cut it. So I have it roughly, you got to start one way one side, put the straight edge down. I typically use, uh, I think this is used for sheetrock, to score sheetrock. I found that it's amazingly easy to score carbon fiber with it as well. Then you score the first line, and then you have this. And then it's just a matter of nice and carefully start cutting. So we'll set up for the cutting as well. Again, there are so many different ways of doing this. I sincerely believe in simplicity. I'm sure you all figured this out by now. So what I'm gonna do is simply have this laying like this and you start now you can use automatic sauce if you want i do prefer to use old-fashioned sauce so we'll make sure that i have plenty of light so i can see it and then that's all you need to do one thing that uh, before we start this is carbon fiber so you always want to make sure that you either or both evacuate the uh, the dust so what I'm doing here is setting up a dust evacuation system that will suck out dust from this so I'll tape this here and uh, we'll start cutting Work. And 
There you have it. Onward to the other side. Then it's time to make uh, the side cut. So I'm going to overlap a little bit on this side here so we can use that as a test when we go to the engraver. So a right angle, make sure that you're inside where it really should be, meaning you don't have any weird fabrics. So here we go, right angle. Carefully score it. That looks about right. There you have it. On to cotton page number two. careful when you get to the end. No pressure on the blade, let the blade do its work. There you have it. Second side. And on to the last. scoring line is now where it needs to be and you can see we left a little bit of extra that the engraver can uh, get the laser set right with. I kind of spoiled it a little bit here but uh, anyway um, that's a whole different chapter that will be documented as well so we'll now cut the last piece. Then it is time to mark and score the last line. And there you have it. Time to cut the last. Then you simply do what you've been doing so far. Keep cutting. The important part is, you're not in a hurry. Let the blade do its job. Now you can use mechanical tools if you feel like it. But the problem with the mechanical tools, electrical rather, is they heat up the carbon and they tend to, if you're not careful, very easy to uh, heat stress the epoxy. Especially if it's not a sharp blade or rotisserie or not rotisserie, rotating blade that you're using. So anyway, take it easy. <laughs> Again towards the end, very careful, let the blade do its job. Back off, way off on the pressure. And 
And there you have it. Now all we've got to do is sand the sides. And you grab a sanding block very carefully because all of these little cutlings here are extremely sharp. All you're trying to do is to make it an even surface that has, well, little to no sharp pointed pieces. That'll work. Other side, that's all you're trying to do. This is like uh, sanding a lead pencil. It comes off so extremely fast. So you don't need to do a whole lot. You're just trying to press it up just ever so slightly. So there you have it, a fine, very square piece of carbon fiber. So I went to visit the engraver today, got the order in and we, well, I brought a little test piece. This is uh, one of the cutoff pieces and here you can kind of, kind of see it pop in there. That'll be the idea. And now we get to fill it in with gilding paste. And here's the test pattern done with uh, this gilding wax as in there. Kind of get an idea. I think that pops pretty good. So that is a go. We'll have the engraver do it just like that. Here's the piece back from the engraver. I must say that it's uh, very, very nice. I like the font style. It was uh, burned with a 40 watt laser engraver at a local uh, store here in Grand Junction called uh, oh, Arrow Trophies. I'll be linked to that in the uh, underneath the video. So anyway, now it is time to fill in the uh, engraved areas with gilding wax. So here we are. This is the gilding paste or wax. I'm not going to film this whole scene because it, uh, it it's a very painstakingly slow procedure. But generally the idea is you use the, the, the wax here. This is antique gold. And then you use a Q-tip and you slowly just rubbing in to the uh, engraved areas and be very careful and quickly uh, wipe it off on the outside where it's more glossy so it won't stick to that. But I'll film a little bit so you can kind of see the, the idea of, of how this whole thing works.
you just kind of rub it in in circular motions is what I enjoy the most because uh, that way you you kind of fill it in the porousness of the carbon fiber is uh, is taking it really good but you can see that there is some some overlap and you of course try to minimize that but it is impossible to not have it it's just just the way it is because you have uh, fibers well carbon fibers that is that have been well cut and and some of those fibers are well I don't want to say hanging loose, but that is a, a pretty good description of it um, because they, well, <laughs> it's been, been cut by a laser, to put it mildly. So, you just um, continue. You don't want to just blast a bunch of stuff in there. Um, it is very easy to overdo it and you're just going to be spending more time cleaning everything up afterwards. So it, it is well worth it by just going a little bit slower than you perhaps would want to. And just take your time and uh, there simply is just less cleanup for you to do afterwards. The good thing is the, the glossy part outside of the engraved area does not take to the wax as easy and it is well relatively easy to, to clean that up with some denatured alcohol. So Here you see that. See if I can get a little closer. And it now looks like this, which is, well, not really nice. So, then you grab, you can do a couple of things. I prefer to stay with Q-tips. And then I dip it in uh, rubbing alcohol. And now you just go around the edge and methodically Get rid of the stuff that are out there. You get the drift. It is a long-term procedure. So I'll turn the camera off until I can work on it. We'll be back in a second. So after about 15 minutes, the B is done. So you can see it is a painstakingly long procedure that, well, it just takes a lot of time, but I think this method is well worth it uh, as the results are, well, they are, in my humble opinion, speak for themselves. Onward to the E. And here it is. All finished, it took about two hours actually. Um, so it's, it's something, it's an old school method, but uh, it, it looks really nice, but uh, you also need to be ready to spend some time, <laughs> get sore shoulders and fingers and whatnot. But there it is. Now it's time to mount it in the uh, frame. And here is the finished piece. All framed up. Quite happy with it, really. Any questions, put them in the comments below.